Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having us. Mm. So, yeah, we're very excited to to talk about so many things. <laughs> mm. So I just will say for the benefit of the listeners, I found you guys on Instagram. And I know you have this massive following on YouTube. If anyone out there listening has not heard of y'all, they should go check you out. Your videos are so beautiful and your photography and the fact that you guys have traveled everywhere together. It's so inspiring. And I, as you know, am particularly interested in asking about your time in Tibet. I feel like there is, like when I looked at your stories, it felt to me so supercharged, like there was so much underneath, like yet to uncover and unpack. But before we get into Tibet, how long were you guys traveling? In Tibet or just Or just like in general, how long have you guys been together adventuring around the world? I would say like we've been Years? Four years. Three or four years. Four years, now. I would say, yeah, when uh, we decided to sell everything we owned back in Toronto, Canada, and we just felt like there was something out there that we needed to find within ourselves, and we just went. You know, we packed up and left and started in uh, Indonesia and then kept going. Just, just let the wind take us. Yeah. <laughs> Traveled to many different countries and places and came back to Canada from time to time. So we kind of went back to and see forth. Yeah. But it was, it was very interesting because when we come back, we didn't have anywhere to go. So we just, the beautiful thing is we just end up at our mother's places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we That's so good. come back to mom and be like, we're alive. We're well, yeah. And then, and then we'll be off stay again. Stay <laughs> for a week or two and then be off again. Yeah. So yeah. it was a very special time. Mm-hmm. And so literally you just let, like you said, you just let the wind take you. So you, how would you decide where you went next? You heard about some place or you always wanted to go or? There was a couple of places that we really wanted to go for sure. A lot of the times as well, we just kind of would meet people along our travels yeah. and hear stories and, you know, everyone's kind of on their own path and journey, especially when you're in different environments that are a little bit outside of your comfort zone and people love to share, people love to connect. And so we've heard about so many beautiful places just from friends that we've made along the way. Mm -hmm. And they kind of guided us towards the places that we felt also calling to as well. Yeah, for the first, I don't even know, half a year, if not more, it was kind of like intuitive travel. We just sort of listened to what was pulling and then respond Mm -hmm. and be like, okay, we'll go there. And it was never very far. It wasn't like we were jumping jumping from continent to continent. It would be like... We're in one town in Indonesia and we hear about another. So we go, okay, let's go there. Or, you know, like everything in Southeast Asia is quite close. So like if we were in Thailand, we would just take like an hour plane ride to Cambodia, you know, because it's so close. So Mm kind of figured out our way, our our path through that way as well. But we we try really hard to find people whose energy aligned with us, who had been places that really affected Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be, because there's like, I think they call it like the gringo pass or something like that which is kind of like up the coast of thailand and around through cambodia it's and then Laos. up into Laos. Yeah. like it's like it's like the the typical kind of mm-hmm. go-to and which not to take anything away from the experience of that but we were just like we wanted to sort of find our own path yeah and go somewhere that's not as popular maybe and that was actually a way that we were able to find one of the most beautiful places that touched our hearts is kind of going off the beaten path. Many of the beautiful yeah. places. I mean, yeah. that's what the, all of them. Like little islands in Thailand, like we would go towards, you know, there's like the famous islands where everyone goes. I can't remember the names on the top of my head right now. Koh Samui. Koh Samui, exactly. But then we'd always kind of go to like the quieter ones or the ones that are less populated. And then those are the ones you're like, wow, like you'd find the most magnificent places that aren't as touched by the hand of tourism so. and they mm-hmm. bring the greatest challenges to get there yeah. and to survive and or eat vegan when yeah. you're there but they also bring the greatest reward because you find I don't know, we would believe that we would find exactly what we were looking for mm-hmm. um, in each of those places which was really special it's such a luxury to i mean i think i think of myself now running a business 
where I don't necessarily have to be on a time frame, but many people are on a time frame. Like, right, they might get like a certain amount of time off their job and they know they have. I feel like to do intuitive travel, you may just need like a little bit more open schedule, right? Where you can afford to go here when you feel like, and it's not all pre planned out. So, did you guys just like save up a bunch of money before you left and kind of. Yeah. Give- I th- we did a lot of saving yeah, and for the first to put year. into the business, actually. And then we put all our savings into a program called Bold Beautiful in 10 Days, Mm -hmm. which was kind of like, when we do that, hopefully that will be able, along with the revenue we make from YouTube, be able to keep us getting to this point. I remember we had like a marker of this much money a month will be enough. And we were lower than that. And I actually went through a really bad injury with my back. Like I had a, a terrible herniation and... I, I believe, actually we talked about this on our live stream this morning, but I, I feel like a lot of the injury came from deeper energy that mm-hmm. inside of me that I needed to get rid of. And a lot of that came from where the location and the position and what our life was all about, living in the urban crazy life of Toronto. Mm-hmm. And so when the injury happened, I was like, I couldn't get off the living room floor for two months. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Julian me it was like unbelievable and the medical system is such a mess here i couldn't get any attention from anyone so i just live in pain but this that is pain's a, the worst oh no, yeah it was but this is a story about realizing that we had to go so well i was in that state we were just like we don't have the money we don't have anything set but we're we getting just gotta do out it. of here i was like and if i'm not back on my feet i will just lie in the back of the van we will just drive somewhere and i don't it's <laughs> literally like we even noticed their landlord and we were just like we just had to go, you know, it was just like this feeling inside of you. You're like, I just need to go because I felt like time was just slipping by and another year and another year was going by. And there's so many places and so many things that we wanted to discover in this life. And we just didn't feel like we were getting close enough to that point by just living in Toronto and kind of going through this kind of, you know, the day to day life. So it was, yeah, it was a scary step. But rewarding at the same time because we the universe took care. Yeah, and I feel like as people we evolved so much just by immersing ourselves in different culture, and it helped us understand so much of our own place on this earth, and just the way people live out there and survive, and the kindness of humanity as well. Like meeting local people in certain countries and just seeing how some of these people had literally nothing you know, but they had so much love and kindness in their heart and they were willing to share with people like ourselves, just like coming into their, to their land and, and uh, being tourists. And that was just, it was such a beautiful experience to see and, and to feel. It was that human connection that we were really longing for. And we found it on the other side of the world with all of these kind people out there. And then when we learned all that, I think we realized that everything we needed was always inside of us which was the most interesting thing because we were always talking about like when we left like where is home and what are we supposed to be doing and what do we we need to go find something and everything was about like the doing of things Mm -hmm. and realizing that we went out there and then we stopped doing things and we just were we just we we practiced being (laughs) and then that was like wow we can do this anywhere we don't have to travel around the world like crazy all the time wander with the wind even though it's wonderful to do that and i can't wait till we can do it again one day if we can but um it was really it's there's such an interesting duality that traveling teaches you you don't need to travel what is it you feel that reconnected you guys with the beingness inside of yourself a good question i would say understanding that the world is such a massively amazingly beautiful like just incredibly massive place filled with billions of people and bringing it into some kind of scope where you understand that you're nothing but you're also a part of everything yes yes you go from country to country and it's just like there's like it's i i get weird when i think about it because there's so many people you hear there's seven billion people but you don't realize what that actually yeah but when until you're in like I don't even know, like, what was that little town in Borneo? Like, with the, what's the Borneo town? I'm just like, until you're in a weird little town in Borneo, and then <laughs> go up on a Saturday night, and there's like 10,000 people. And you're like, I'm in a place I didn't know existed until a month ago. Until yeah. <laughs> that morning, even yeah. sometimes. And it's like, and yeah. all these people this is your life. Kodak in the Kodak in the Yeah, yeah, it's so crazy. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is like, it didn't exist. 
for mm-hmm. you, right? Like it didn't exist for you, but like absolute reality, it, it does yeah. exist. Totally. It's such a crazy feeling. And I think what Mark was just saying, the understanding of how small you are really, it's like when you go out onto a beach and you look out on this vast ocean and you really realize like, wow, I'm just as small as this grain of sand really, right? And it's almost yes. hum- humbling because it makes you realize that, you know, we live with like our egos inflate to a point where like we feel like we're this and that and we deserve to have all yeah. these things. And then it's like, you humble yourself and ground yourself. You're like, wow, I'm just part of this magical existence and earth dimension. I'm just part of it. I'm not yeah. you know, the control of it. It's, it's- yeah. It reminds me of something my teacher told me a long time ago, my spiritual teacher. He said, when you are like so feeling so low and so small and so broken and you are just like nothing but a speck of dirt or dust it's then that you become the whole world it's beautiful and it sounds like that was your experience yeah, it's amazing I love, I love that too it's, that's that's so, so it does sound like that yeah yeah i think maybe that's what i don't know i think as the years go by we continue to process and as time goes on, we learn more from everything and we learn a deeper understanding of what we learned and expand upon that learning. It's like just a constant, as long, I, I believe as long as you're open to growth, it will never stop. So even though you, it was something we did years ago, we're still right now we're processing it again and right. taking more fruit from, as a harvest. From it. It's really beautiful. I don't think you ever stop growing. Mm-hmm. I think you're always on this path. And at the very, very end, I want to ask you guys about your experience with this holiness, the Dalai Lama. But something that you said, Mark, reminded me of, of that too, because that feeling when you get a sense of how many people are on this planet, and it's just like totally overwhelming, and you just can't believe how many people there are. And you think like, with just me, with just my little microcosm of stuff, there's like so much complexity and so much challenge and so much stuff right and then you like compound that times seven billion and then when you hear about traditions like um like in tibetan buddhism where they say that chen rezig was an actual person or human being that was incarnated on the planet and who made this like vow i will not become fully enlightened until every last sentient being on the planet has become enlightened and I will take birth and reincarnate and come back until every last human being has become enlightened. And it's just like, oh my God, that kind of compassion is mind blowing because when you get that sense of like how many of us there are, wow. That's it's amazing. insane, right? It really is. I don't know. And for everything that we've seen, which is very little because we're just two people doing our little thing. It's an endless abyss of those people, that mm-hmm. understanding. And you think about what kind of compassion that would take us. Um, oh my gosh, it's mind blowing. I didn't know that story. Either. It's really great. Yeah. So, okay. So tell me about your time in Tibet. I, I've, I've read some and I've watched your videos and just enough to ask you some good questions. But maybe if you want to just sort of, you know, take us into where you were at when you were deciding to go and how you entered? Well, Tibet, I think, has been one of those places that we knew for a long time that it was on our bucket list. Like, it was just a place we wanted to go. Oh, and, well, I mean, we one, we felt very deeply connected to a lot of the teachings of Buddhism and also the Dalai Lama has been a great inspiration in our lives. Personally, we read many of his books and his teachings have just um, had a very special place in our heart. And I mean, we watched a lot of documentaries about it too, which are you know, movies, too. movies that portrayed a lot about Tibet and the situation, everything that happened. And so I think when we were, you know, thinking about like, where would we love to go and really allow ourselves to evolve even further, Tibet was definitely that one place. And it was quite challenging to get into it because unlike- We had no idea. We like, had no idea until we started really looking I, into it. I think we, want, Tibet. we wandered into it really- naive I think mm-hmm. in a way with a romanticism built around Tibet I think when we we were in Dharamshala in India yeah. a year beforehand that's when we actually got to meet the Dalai Lama um, and when we were in Dharamshala it was a place because the Dalai Lama that was mostly Tibetan refugees yeah. and so you met a lot of Tibetan refugees there and then 
all of a sudden we were reminded about this deep yearning that I think we've had for a long time. It started, I think, for me when I watched, when it came, in the theaters, I saw seven years in Tibet. And it was like, it's a very like pivotal moment in pop culture to define my politics and, and my views of the world. And I think like just through our teachings together and our wanderings, learning more about the Dalai Lama in Tibet and hearing other people have been there. Okay, 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 okay. So you met him first before you went to Tibet. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just talk about that first then, because that came chronologically first. Because I'm sure, I mean, I've met him several times, and everyone has their own experience. It's very otherworldly, and I was just curious what your experience was like. It was amazing. I mean, the way we got to be able to meet him was we were in India and in Dharamshala at the time uh, doing teacher trainings for yoga. And um, that's where he's exiled, right? So we knew that from time to time. And he, at that moment, that week, he was doing a lot of teachings for younger Tibetan children. He was three. He was doing three days of open teachings days? in mm-hmm. Tibetan for, yeah, for, 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 for kids. like school kids. And then like last minute, he ended up adding one more day. And it was like on a Saturday afternoon that he was going to do in English. And it was for all foreigners, like anybody that wanted to go. But you had to like, you had to go register. But they didn't even announce. This was what was really weird about it. They didn't announce. They didn't like, there was an announcement and a placement on his website for the the school children ones. But then somehow, Juliana and her school found out that they had quietly just released some information on the side that there'd be an extra day foreigners in English. So so lucky. It was so crazy. We were in the middle of our teaching. Uh, for, she was at one yoga school, I was at another. Immediately, her school was like, we're going. And they all went and they had to go sign up and you get your passports and you do all kinds of, go through like just the administration of it. And I remember from my yoga school, I was like, I was floored. I was just like this, what are the odds? Of, like, like just being here on the planet at this moment with this happening and, this, and it's like it, all the things. And I was over the moon. And I remember going to like people in my school and everyone was super excited. And then when I went to the school, the school's like, you guys, you guys can't go. We're like, what? And it turned into this whole thing. And I kind of led like this weird like <laughs> student rebellion against the teachers of the school, the main teacher of the school to be like, we're going and it doesn't matter either. So Good it, job. <laughs> it, it may have ruined the rest of my time in relationship with that school, but we ended up going. Yeah, and, and so I was, everybody showed up, but because they weren't publicly announcing it everywhere, like on the websites, the turnout to his lecture was quite small. There was, was probably crazy. like maybe 100, 150 people that showed up in this big room. Well, people got, it was so empty that people could just wander in. Like, mm-hmm. like it was most of the time we would say, like, you'd wait in line for a day yeah. and be lucky to, or whatever. And it was like, well, that's, the, that's the the blessing of seeing him in India, right? Like you come to see him in the U.S. and there might be like 10,000, 20,000 people in the auditorium, right? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. And this was just like, it felt like such an intimate experience. And I remember they, before he showed up, they kind of put, put us all in groups based on countries. And so they kind of combined a couple of smaller countries together. And we were just all standing in groups waiting for his holiness to come out. And I remember that moment when, he was coming out and he's going to take a photo with each country mm-hmm. group. And I remember seeing him and it was just like, it's so hard to explain, but it's like this energy and maybe you can relate to it since you've met him yourself. But like, there's just this beautiful radiance about this human being that like just mm-hmm. comes from him. And when he entered and I remember I got like goosebumps all over my body and I was like, Oh my God, I, I felt so starstruck. You know, like, oh my God. Was... To me, I felt like, oh my God, it's the Dalai Lama. Like, that's so amazing. I've just, you know, for so many years, I've read so much about him and to see him in person and to feel his energy was so, so special. And I remember when he came close to our group and we all had to kind of like kneel. And... Well, he came into the group. He like mm-hmm. floated in. He <laughs> seemed to float everywhere. And I like incense around him. And everybody's him. burning like, incense yeah. around him and smoke. And you're just like, you're watching him approach. And he came and he get, got inside the group. And we'd seen him do this with a couple other groups, yeah. do the photo. And then, I don't know, somehow, like we're sitting there. And I just see Juliana put her hand up. Because like, we had to like all kind of like pose. And then all of a sudden I look over and I see the Dalai Lama reach out and grab her hand and I'm like no way and then I and then so right there is like her hand holding it so and then everyone just goes and like grabs Juliana's hand and, it, and then they took a picture and there's so there's this moment that they have this follow-up where there was just this like beautiful connection of it because everyone it was like 
everyone was just in this space of, I don't know, just bliss or just like just pure really positivity. Yeah. And um, here the next day, actually, one of the guys ran into my little basement apartment at the school I was staying at with his phone. And he holds it up to me and it was the Dalai Lama.com and then there's a picture of Juliana and, and, and the guy on the front of his website. I'm like, what are the odds of this? That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. It was amazing. But after that, he went up on stage and we got, uh, got to sit in, actually, we got to sit on the front row too, which was super cool. And he just took questions. I think he took about 10 questions and people all lined up and he just talked and answered beautiful. questions. And it was really, really beautiful. And it was just to hear his teachings. And he had a translator with him as well, you know, to help him certain times when he couldn't, you know, say the right words. But it was a really, really universe kind of brought everything together and, you know, the right place. It was, it was yeah. so special. And mm -hmm. there's lots of, there's just like a, a message of inclusion, mm -hmm. I think, that was really beautiful about all his teachings. That was just, it spoke really clearly to us in yeah. a way of like the one family, one world concept of us all being part of something greater than ourselves. I don't know. I, I had never seen him lean into that in such a way, even in so far that people were challenging a little bit on veganism and vegetarianism. And there was some weirdness with some uh, interpretation with his translators. I don't think he was getting the full questions, but it was amazing because it was the first time I publicly heard him say that he was like fully encouraging a vegetarian lifestyle. And I understand that if he says go vegetarian, that everyone in Tibet may starve after being there, especially because they can't grow any food. Mm -hmm. So I understand why you might be a little reluctant to say that, but that was the first time I've ever been with, like being like, I encourage this. Like, if you can, then you should. And mm -hmm. I was just like, from a Buddhist perspective, I mean, just to hear him say that, it's amazing yeah. to hear. So just because yeah, of the nonviolent aspect of it. I think yeah. it's really, it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, that was really probably the best day of our lives. Yeah, <laughs> we're just like glowing. I don't know why. It, so it, was, it was really beautiful. It's so hard to put words into it, isn't it? It's almost like you're kind of like, there's this bizarre anticipation, right? It's like, you're all waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. There's this weird anticipation. And then suddenly he's there. And it's like somebody turned on the sun. Mm. Yeah, that's how it felt like, totally. It's, yeah. And the energy, it's so beautiful. And he's such a beautiful human being. It's like, wow, so mm -hmm. special. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. And I like somebody turned on the sun. Mm -hmm. I think you're so right about that. So did that experience inspire you to go to Tibet? I think it, it just pushed us further because I think that the desire to go there was already, you know, ingrained in our there. hearts before that, but then meeting him and also seeing the Tibetan refugees in India and learning a little bit more of the history of Tibet even further. I think that was another reason that we were like, we got to go, we got to see, we got to experience, you know, we just felt like we needed to know more. Mm -hmm. And the best way to know more is to go. Yeah. Um, Immerse yourself in it. And to experience yeah, it yourself, right? Really figure out how to. At least then your knowledge is based on your own personal experience, which is limited, which I understand. But to that respect, at least you have some firsthand mm -hmm. understanding. Right. I think that I'm very, very, very grateful we pushed ourselves to go because. As Juliana started to say with all this, it, it's not easy no. and it's not cheap and they make it really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, they actually don't allow tourists, quote unquote, to enter Tibet. Like you can't just be a backpacker that wants to show up. It's like a whole process where you have to get a tourist group visa or an actual visa into China. And in order to do that, you have to like apply and you have to tell them what you do. And there's like a whole process where they have to approve you. And you have to have a, a, a tour company yeah. sign on. Oh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. so just one quick question. Is the visa different from getting a regular visa into China because you're going to Beijing? You ha or are you getting a special visa because you want to go to Tibet? I mean, you could use your Chinese visa if you already have one, but I, I know that you have to have a tour company in Tibet, in Tibet say that like, we're going to be taking care of you because they don't want anybody that's not with the tour company just wandering around. And then know. the tour company submits the itinerary. Yeah. And to that's the, the only government. way you get the permission to go. So you have to build an itinerary and then that gets submitted. And then anywhere you go, through the myriad of checkpoints through Tibet that like it's pretty stressful. It looks like on the drivers, they get really upset 
when it comes time to be checked and they have to get all their paperwork out and prove it's the day that you're supposed to be there. And basically like when you check in the town, you check with the cops, when, you check, when you're driving through highways, you're checking through points. It's like military checkpoints. It's just, and, yeah. It was, that was it, just that itself. Like, well, just to get into to that itself, it took us like a lot of, it was like a month process to get through. Least, oh my God. Yeah. And a fortune. It costs and, so much money. And the thing is when we found out that the money doesn't even go to tour companies, like, they'd get very little, which is crazy. So and we it's made just money it like the government for occupying Tibet. Like. Yeah, and we were really conscious about choosing a Tibetan run touring company oh, yeah. because there's so many tour companies are some that are run only by Tibetan people. And so at least that made us feel like okay, we're, we're supporting. helping supporting the, the Tibetan communities and the people that are working because you know, now, this is their livelihood. And I'm really glad. I think it was just like our intuition said to do that mm -hmm. but it turns out that i think our tour experience would have been much different with the chinese tour group mm -hmm. and we're, i don't know so grateful that something told us to take a look to go the way that we did yeah yeah you know we had to explain to the company like we don't oh, yeah. want to just go to like the typical places where everyone goes and just takes photos like we had to explain to them what we're doing we were at the, that time shooting a meditation program that we're hopefully we'll be releasing sometime this summer. maybe this summer and so we had to really like explain to them like what we're doing so they understand to take us to the places that are a little bit more desolate that are not filled with 100 people with selfie sticks you know <laughs> so it like it which was, was yeah which was a little bit of a challenge it was a huge challenge for them to understand i think as well too because no i don't think a lot of people do that and i don't know if we were necessarily fully allowed to do that so i think they took a risk mm -hmm. a little bit wow. in like allowing us to use them as our tour company because once we were there and trying to find locations to shoot it was difficult with our driver and our tour guide to be like no no we need to be working like we have to like we're here like we're not just like because they want you to just go to the typical temple where there's a thousand people you're, you're actually not a tourist yeah like in a, in a way like know. we are tourists but we but, also yeah. are here because we end up 21 different meditations in 21 different locations all over to all over to that yeah. and it, which was amazing mm -hmm. but it was it was a challenge for them to really understand okay so real quick let me just rewind a little bit if in case there are any listeners who just aren't um aware of why like maybe aren't aware of what happened in tibet with the chinese occupation why is it from your perspective why are you not you know necessarily allowed to go where you want to go why does it require so many military checkpoints to get in well, give us some hit historical context yeah i mean it's tough to talk about this because there's a lot of versions of history surrounding tibet and there's a lot of versions of people what they claim is the truth it's very similar to the climate and politics in america in today's day like or you know like where there's just different camps and the camp that yeah. you're from has a completely different translation of not just what happened of, but why it's still happening today so but i will preface this i guess yeah. like a disclaimer to just say that this is based on the things we've, we've worked really hard to try to understand an honest perspective and we worked really hard we, part of the reason we wanted to go is to understand like why are there all these refugees here what's going on and why are they like they can't even go home okay. like there's so there's so much in us that we wanted to know more and from the evidence, or I wouldn't say evidence, the experience that we had there. And then with our guides and people that we would meet that we could speak English with, which was probably about five to 10% of actual Tibetans, we tried to extract as much as we could to get an understanding. But it's tricky and it's nuanced. And I think that there's probably a little misinformation on both sides. But in our perspective, I think there's a lot more coming from when you're in Tibet and you Google the Dalai Lama in Tibet, because all that comes up is stuff that says he's a monster. Well, because China controls everything. I mean, even when you're, you can't use your social media, like YouTube is banned in China. We had to get like this VPN network. VPN network to be able to connect to our social media because everything is blocked because China is controlling, you know, all the information. They want people to know a certain way. So that, that was so interesting for us to Google the Dalai Lama in China versus Googling the Dalai Lama in Nepal, on, even. Or on that VPN network, but yeah. we're saying we're it was in England or something. It was a completely different description of His Holiness. Sure. And so, I mean, what is a gentle way to say it? I, 
you know, to vet to us what we saw and experienced was oppression. And yeah, it was, it's an yeah, occupied, occupied, independent nation. That, mm-hmm. that, and there is a lot to say about what the history was before of the most recent occupation. Because when we post it any in Tibet, we get an onslaught of negativity. Mm-hmm. Because there's an army of people and bots. There's actually been proven that there's bots. massive amounts of people who work for the Chinese government that unfold the narrative of what happened in Tibet. So they find anything online that they can comment on, and they just make the discussion about the history being one way and the current state being another. And both work together to say that what's going on here is for the benefit of the people of Tibet. I mean, but starting from when the Dalai Lama left, because you know, I think it was 70 years ago, 1950? 1959, he was officially exiled from Tibet, and China invaded Tibet in 1950. And so throughout that time, the information that we've learned, I mean, there's 1.2 million people that lost their lives. They've destroyed 6,000 monasteries. I mean, there is a lot that mm-hmm. happened, and it broke our hearts because not only was that information that we learned just from our own studies, but that was also something that we heard from the local people that we met. Like, this is what happened. Like we heard stories of how, you know, they had to protect some of their sacred scriptures and books because they were so afraid, you know, to be destroyed. And and it's a story unlike most. And then then I think I'll also say that this isn't unique to the globe. I think it's really important to, to understand that to us here in North America, we are just as guilty. Like our land here was not our land before. And our governments 200 years ago did terrible things. And they continued to do them all the way into the 1900s to basically acquire the land and marginalize indigenous populations. And they're still doing it. In Canada, we're still having protests on the on the railway tracks. They shift on the railway tracks about, about like treaty, like grievances. There's oil, like obviously there's a ton in America that, that Standing Rock here, up here, we also have tons of pipeline issues because they're just driving industry through the lands, the, the tiny little pieces of the land that they gave. So we're not saying that we're righteous and China's bad. Mm-hmm. We're saying that this behavior of imperialism and genocide through human history needs to be acknowledged. And if it's still happening, it needs to be discussed. And in a perfect world, I don't know, somehow figured to find a solution that works for everyone. And to say that we've come so far in our evolution of technology and our evolution of industry. But I think we have to go further in our evolution of empathy towards understanding that our history is not perfect either. And and that's really important because, again, anytime we mention anything about Tibet, someone will just point a finger and be like, who are you to talk about this? What about your country? And they're like, yeah, we know. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. And they have our sympathies here too, like 100%. And we'll do anything we can to support their plight as well too. But right now in Tibet, it's actively still going on yeah. on a level of suppression of, of information, of religion, of movement. Like you can't even travel from city to city. You can't leave Tibet as a Tibetan. You're not allowed to leave your own They're country. They're imprisoned in their own country. And as far as I checked last time in America or Canada, we're not doing those kinds of things. We're doing other things. But it's not actively that aggressive. Um, and so I think in under the terms of what we saw, and what we heard, and the people that we talked to, and what you can read online on both sides, it's pretty clear that like it's not black and white, but it's definitely it's a, it's atrocity. Like it's 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 a terrible situation. It's really heartbreaking, and I think because there is all of that still happening in Tibet, what we feel like China is doing, they're trying to control what people are exposed to, and what they see, and what they communicate back to the rest of the world. So that is why, you know, you cannot take photographs of the Red Army. You just can't. You will get, like, they'll imprisoned. keep you imprisoned. <laughs> yeah. you, can't, like, you can't talk about the dialogue? You cannot mention his word, like, his name in Tibet. Like, yeah. there is, I mean, I could go on, right? Like, the, 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 the amount of security measures, like, even from walking through Lhasa, for example, that was the first town that we came to. We flew into it from Nepal. And, you know, you want to take some time to climatize to the altitude because the elevation is really difficult oh, yeah. on your body. And we struggled with it a lot. Um, so we spent, what, three days in Lhasa and just walking through the towns of Lhasa. You know, you're just walking and you're enjoying like a market or something. And then middle nowhere, there is a police checkpoint. And it's like at the airport, you got to put your bag through a scanner and they like check your passport. And that's, and, like, 
strategically <laughs> placed on yeah. every axis to the old town yeah. and preserved historic area of the Tibetan culture. Wow. And so it's it's you can't actually enter or get in without showing the passport, getting checked in, showing your check, visa, the whole yeah. deal. And it's just and it's just maybe that isn't necessarily nefarious in the sense of like, well, what's so bad about that? But what I guess the, the other side of that is, and it seems to you know to as unbiasedly as we can assess the situation, that it's just to create a presence, mm-hmm. a presence of mm-hmm. you are subservient, you're here as our guest. You will behave the way we want you to, and we will know where you are at all times. And if you step out of line, much like six, like millions, I would say millions of Tibetans since this point, you'll be disappeared. Like you will literally, like if like people told us of experiences they had, Tibetans that we met, or family members or people they knew stepped out of the line of the marching step and they're nowhere to be seen. And that's crazy. It's like it's like the story of the Pachin Lama. Like that's crazy too. Like the fact that a young boy can be kidnapped because the Dalai Lama chooses him to be the next Pachin Lama, and all of a sudden, like the government just swoops him away, and he's never seen from again. And then they choose their own Pachin Lama because it's about control. Yeah. Because if they can control history, they can control how people speak about what happened. And then if they can control what gets talked about today, then what do they get? They get to control the future. And that's what they're looking to do. Tibet is, I think, a third, almost a third of the land mass and resources of China. It's a massive piece. It drives, as we saw, millions and millions of dollars of tourism a year. They get access to Mount Kailash, which is like the biggest, most significant spiritual spiritual mountain in the world. Like Manasarvar. You know, they get and they get they get access to one side Everest. It becomes a piece of their dominance, and and it gives them access in the gateway to. To Nepal, which is being fought over between India and China and their resources, and they're under the heels of both of those countries. It's, it's like we could go on and on and on. I know I've taken this way further than I thought I would, but it's a messy situation. Yeah. And there's no clarity. And we believe because of all of this, this is why the security was so tough. And that's why we had to be so careful of what we shot and not to step out of line to raise a red flag. A red flag. <laughs> and that is why we believe that after, you know, we left Tibet and we created our Boho Diary where we wanted to share with our audience and the people in the world about our personal experience and how we saw what we saw with our own eyes, why we know now like there is no way we'll ever step into China again. They will never let us back in. We were totally banned from China now because we're on we spoke about it the wrong way and we are on their radar now because they keep track of you. They have our fingerprints, they have our face scans, they have our eyeball scans, they have everything. And so we ever wanted to apply for another visa yeah wait 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 hold on let me let me rewind i think we missed a step here <laughs> yeah so did you guys get censored okay so you shared your experience in the form of a video mm-hmm, yeah mm-hmm. on our youtube channel did you get censored or is it because simply that of you posting this video and the fact that they have all of your not a formal banning. I had a hard enough time personally. I've been into China twice and both times it was very difficult for me. I always get pulled into a room and shaken down a little bit. Don't know why, but we also recognize- You look so dangerous, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird, but we just- You too, it, Juliana. <laughs> <laughs> the idea, I think that we know with the backlash that we received- From the Chinese. And people. that there's such little communication, especially on YouTube about Tibet, and exposure about Tibet. And also the amount of background check that they were doing in order to even let us into China in the first place. That if we ever to, try again, there's no way they'll Yeah, because they, 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 they were Googling us. They were, you know, you know. because They brought they, our photographer in and like for triple check. We actually couldn't get in until he went and met with an officer. Like we were in Kathmandu and he had to go to the embassy there because they found out he was a photographer mm-hmm. because we were trying to just be tourists. And he put photographer on his visa and then all of a sudden they googled him and they saw that he works with press because they won't let any press in like it's it's just a containment thing and and at this point we thought about it before we posted the video because we knew the backlash would come we had no idea the amount of chinese like pro-chinese energy that would be sent our way from that video mm-hmm. which was really unsettling i think at the time like we didn't expect mm-hmm. it to be like that but we know with that much attention you have to like we're on the radar and we also shortly after got like we were invited to start working with um, save tibet.org um they saw that so all the the pro-tibet people reached out to it was so beautiful so it's like we just put up a 
a sign and then like got a both sides were like oh cool there's like let's engage and some was really negative and some was super positive and the most amazing thing though after the putting up that video was um uh, and it didn't get a lot of views that's what's so crazy it's not like it's a, one of our big videos or anything it actually got quite a small amount of views in comparison to a lot of our videos mm -hmm. but somehow a lot of tibetans saw it and then just sent these emails to us just thinking just, us for even like they were like this is the first time i've seen my country from this perspective oh. and they were just so grateful to be able to have that experience through a video because you know they miss it they miss well, their culture or they've never seen their or they've never like, seen it they, mm -hmm. like typing to us telling us they're in tears and they're this and yeah. like just these beautiful stories of just them opening themselves up because like this little video we did and that was like, the most beautiful like so all the other stuff to us doesn't even matter anymore because that happened we're just like that's that was just so so special and so beautiful that it made it all worth it and if we can't go back to the bed that's okay i mean it's really we're, we made our peace with that before we put it up and since we made our peace with that now when we do put out our meditation program that we shot there we want to donate a large portion of it to all the Refugees. tibetan refugee organizations and, and give back to those people too mm -hmm. because i think if that video they enjoyed seeing, no, I mean, I'm really excited for them just like <laughs> to see them like, <laughs> see, like these great. beautiful landscapes that we captured. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, it was so know. special. Mm -hmm. It was. It was. It, as you said at the start, I think there's like, it's a really, really deep and dynamic topic with a lot of, a lot to be uncovered, and we uncovered just in our experience a lot, and I don't know if we could have come out the same way feeling empowered if we'd stayed much longer than we did because it was a hard place to be yeah. as as a western like as a western white tourist in a country where if you check into a certain town you're not allowed to go to certain places because you're white like which, which it, i mean that's it's not saying oh my god look at us because that happened to so many different cultures and, and ethnicities sense. all over the world but just to see the amount they just have to control everything like we try what, to, what type of places you couldn't go to uh, couldn't just stay in certain, certain hotels, hotels. Yeah. couldn't eat at certain restaurants not that there's lots of restaurants and we're just like sort of kitchens certain places you're just not allowed to go at everest like all the westerners are in one set section and all the chinese are in another and you're not allowed to like integrate like it, it's just very like it's very weird and no one talks about it but you're just and like, is it is it um you're not allowed to go to tibetan places because they don't want you mixing tibetans or they don't want you to talk to chinese or like what it's more chinese i find because we've gone to a lot of like tibetan restaurants or little kitchens and they were fine or even well, with our guy there was one town that we tried to find a place to stay and we went into a hotel and the guy kicked us out because it's only for chinese tourists only I think why some hotels have this sort of restriction is because everything is so monitored by the military and by the police that when you come into a town, you have to check in at the police station first so they know exactly where you're staying. And so if you say, I'm staying at this hotel that, you know, that they don't allow white tourists and the owner of that hotel will get in trouble and nobody wants to get in trouble with the military and the police. So people are just very, very afraid. There's definitely a sense of fear yeah, um, sense of embarked on everybody. And so they don't want to cross the line. And that's why, I mean, we weren't mad. Like we understand yeah, when it the, the guy, like, no, it wasn't we're like, oh, like okay, we were we'll taken back, but we can't stay here because we're not Chinese, but they were like, okay, we'll go somewhere else. It's not a big deal, but it was just, you know, it just, it was all this really eye-opening, shocking, unexpected side, like the darker side of just how control is about everything. And so I think it's just like, it's just this general repression of like Western tourists. And I think it's because, I mean, I really came to a head two years ago when two American tourists came to, I think they were just going to the Everest base camp and they ended up breaking away from their group and climbing a side mountain and flying a Tibetan flag and taking a video of it. And there's no such thing as a Tibetan flag in Tibet. You will not see that anywhere. They're just as bad as a photo of the Dalai Lama. And I think they put on social media or something. But anyways, the government came down so hard on them and on the tour guides mm -hmm. and they ended kicked, up they kicked them out of the country oh, yeah. and they were never like they're banned from china but the worst we was, heard mm -hmm. the person we were talking to told us the tour guides in prison um so they were taken away and then all of 
the Everest Base Camp and where you were allowed to go and what you were allowed to do changed drastically. So now it's really contained. It's like going to Everest in a, like a fishbowl. You can't walk to certain places. You can't get cl up close to a certain point. They moved base camp like back four kilometers from where it was before. So it's even further back. And, the, and now it's containable and it's next to a monastery, which is quite beautiful. And so again, like the whole experience of going there is really beautiful, but then you see how just like contained they have it all of a sudden. So no one can go up on the side of the mountain. God forbid they fly a Tibetan flag again. And you're just like, what? Like this is, this is really crazy. And then the government releases statements saying that they're reducing the amount of tourists from Western countries because of altitude sickness. So they say that because they're, they're getting sick and dying. Too many Westerners are coming and getting sick and dying from altitude sickness. So we're reducing the amount of Westerners we're allowing into the country, but it's just conveniently right after this whole incident happens and everything starts. To, and it's just like, there's just this constant like dance of like, like they're trying to, I don't, I don't know, like, like whack a mole, you know, like just to keep control of everything. If anyone steps up, give it a whack and wait for something else to happen. Like just to keep that, you know, that grip of, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I don't know. It's a really crazy time to, thinking about it now. There's a sentence in your blog post that I wanted to repeat. It's so beautiful. And I wondered if you guys could convey some of the magic to us. And it says, it's almost as though an external magic surrounds the land, causing visitors to naturally expand internally. Hmm. Yes. Wow. Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Gotta be one of you. <laughs> yeah, I think. You know, when we left Lhasa and began to travel through the rest of Tibet, there is this, the first town that we went to that really opened this, this feeling in our hearts. It was a town called Gyatse. And we arrived there on the day of a very uh, special holiday. It's like a month-long holiday of Buddha's enlightenment and, and birthday. birthday. Bisak Day. Yes, yeah. And so we went to this local monastery. And it was just the experience to see like these Tibetan families coming together and they spend the whole day at the monastery and they picnic and, you know, they pray and they prostrate and just to sit in that awareness of everything around you and to feel their energy. And again, it was like that feeling of being like, wow, this exists. Like you don't realize that this exists yeah. when you're not there, like you're kind of in your own world. And I don't know. It, it's the story of what you imagine Tibet would be like. Yeah. But when you arrive, you don't see it anywhere. And then when you finally find it. The little small pockets that it still exists, it just touches your heart. And like we were saying before, like there is this kindness and warmness about Tibetan people and their families. And we've just felt so, we felt so welcomed in a country that makes you feel really afraid, you know, with different things. The contrast against yeah, each other. Was the contrast intense. was really, really powerful. And finding this kindness and this connection with people that you can't even communicate in the same language, but you can just feel their energy. It was really, really special. And it made us, you know, really look deep inside ourselves and to feel their energy as well. Like just being in the monasteries and seeing their traditions and to see their prayers and their chants and to feel it. To feel it. These little pockets all exist on this map, in this map of Tibet. I think maybe the external magic outside of the energetic magic exists on a map of the most elevated landmass on the planet. They call it the ceiling of the globe or the ceiling mm -hmm. of the earth because it's by far the highest place on the planet for the biggest piece of land that anyone lives. And just getting to Lhasa takes you days to deal with and you know you have all these oxygen canisters and you're constantly <laughs> trying like, and you're just in a, like in a town and you can't breathe and you're like oh, God, you know, <laughs> that's one thing but then once you start to travel once you go from place to place it's almost it's almost like you're living you're experiencing a, like life inside a novel like a fantasy novel because these there's just like one main road that takes you from one end to the other and as you travel Every corner you go around is a whole, like, can reveal a whole new physical beauty that's so breathtaking that you just, 
you didn't think it could exist unless someone computer animated it and put it inside Lord of the Rings. Like, because it's just like the biggest mountains or the most massive glaciers or the most crystal blue waters or, yeah. and, and you're just like, as you try, like, normally when you travel in a van, like you do your thing or, you know, you flee, or, but in Tibet, you're just like glued to like, if I go to sleep or put my attention anywhere, we're going to round that corner and we're going to enter some other new area of fantasy and magic that you've never seen before yeah. or could have imagined actually exist. Like, it's just like, because it, I don't know if it's because it's at such, a, at such an elevation that it's where all the mountain tops are crushing each other and creating canyons and rivers and snow capped mountains and all these things. I'm not sure what it is, but it's just so. So you, you recorded meditation videos in 12 places, did you say? Uh, 21. 21, like the 21 Taras. Yes. Yeah. It is actually. We yeah. wanted to be able to provide a, a video a day for a three week meditation course. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't wait till that comes but out. In order to do that, we traveled all over Tibet in order to capture the most beautiful, breathtaking spiritual places that we could come across. I mean, it's just even just beautiful, breathtaking. Like some mm -hmm. of them were very significant locations, and the other ones, we would just be like, we just ask her to be like, pull over here. Go down that dirt road and like we go driving for 20 minutes way off the beaten path mm. and come across like a cow pasture. Yeah. It was like a crazy, beautiful, gorgeous, like fantasy mountain in the background. And you're like, well, that's cool. Yeah. Like, let's shoot there. Like, that's and as you're driving through it, I mean, the guide always tells you like, oh, the significance of this place or that place, which was really interesting to learn. But one of the things that was so amazing to be witnessing is the amount of like holy lakes that there are there. And that was something so incredible because one of the things that we experienced through this travel and journey all through Tibet was this deeper connection to a magical energy that exists within this country. And so being able to go to a, a holy lake and it wasn't even like Lake Manasarovar, which is quite holy, many different religions, but like maybe just a Tibetan Buddhist, like that was one particular lake in the middle of this road that was like so significant and when we shot, I'm not sure if um, I already talked about this yet, but we shot this one meditation and I, I remembered in my heart because it just left such a beautiful imprint. But we were shooting a meditation, meditating, and you just, there was an energy and a connection mm -hmm. that I connected to through the meditation where I felt like I was transported into a different dimension, into a different world. And this beautiful connection that I felt, it was so deep that I didn't want to stop the meditation. I was like, I'm going to stay here. The cameras have stopped rolling, but I'm not coming out because I just want to exist in this loving vibration that I'm feeling within me. And Mark and the rest of the team, we had two other guys helping us with it. We all just sat around this lake and meditated. And then Mark and I went into the lake afterwards just to dig our feet into the earth and to feel this ice cold water because all the water is so, so cold in there. And it's really difficult to explain in words the energy that we felt vibrating through our bodies. And I didn't even understand the full significance of the spiritual reason of why this lake was so holy because our guide at the time kind of just mentioned like oh yeah it's a holy lake number you know? two he was yeah like, this is the second they weren't really he didn't go I don't into know how they rank the holiness <laughs> of things but it ranked number, number two. two and it was like <laughs> he didn't really go into too much detail of why but i don't think i needed to it it was more it was about the feeling. energy and the feeling to feel it and so there were so many different moments like this lake experience that we felt through Tibet and that was oh just a magical magical but what experience. was really special I think was that sewn through the culture of Tibet and the fact that our guides were Tibetan and they were very deeply connected to being able to tell you the stories of everything mm -hmm. you very quickly realize that like like I was saying earlier every corner you turn is a whole new thing when whatever that thing is we got very very engrossed in the habit of asking so he would be like tell us about that mm -hmm. and he'd be like oh well since you asked and there would always be this elaborate historical spiritual significance to every mountain and every river and every lake and there's stories and history and and it was just so like you, you do that in america and you're like tell me about this or in canada you're tell me about that mountain they're like oh that's mount robson it's the biggest mountain in canada mm -hmm. and there was only one time in that we, we came upon a mountain and I was like, tell us about this one. And he was like, 
because it, its name translates. Oh, he's like this name. This is the name, and it translates to like giant beauty. And I was like, okay, well, why is it called that? And he's like, because it's very big and beautiful. We're like, that's the only one. <laughs> Remember that one? Like, holy crap! There's no significance. Yeah. He's like, nope, not to that one. But that was such a rarity because everything we saw, he had, had these like story had such it. beautiful lineage to it. Yeah. So I don't know. That was that's the really funny. Yeah. One. It was a gorgeous mountain. It was, yeah. And one of our last stops before we left Tibet was Mount Kailash. And that was really amazing. We actually, we planned, we were in Darshan, which is like the town, the base of it. We were stayed there for two days to climatize to the altitude again. It was the highest point. It was the highest point. And we actually had to leave before we could do the trek because Mark got extremely altitude sick. Like he almost died. It was crazy, actually. And not the dying part. It was more about, in the town of Darchin, it was like, it's such, it was such a feeling in this, in this area. And it was freezing cold. And the rooms that we stayed in, they don't have heaters. They just have a heated blanket. And so we were like freezing, but wandering around the town, like in the base of Kalash. And Kalash is so magnificent. And there's so many amazing mystical stories oh, yeah. and legends and conspiracy theories. And just everything surrounding this mountain. And there's like three of the major religions on the earth who might will like do pilgrimages once a year, or not once a year, once a lifetime to the be Korra, there. Yeah, the three to day do the Korra, Korra to around. walk around. Mm -hmm. So we had this whole plan to do the Korra. And so we spent two days just like getting supplies because we didn't have warm enough clothes and we had to buy enough oxygen. So we wandered around this little village, Darchin. And then the night we were going to leave, for whatever reason, I remember I called my sister. Um, randomly over the internet and i talked to my sister and was telling her about how excited we are and we're getting up in the morning and julianne is already asleep and and but i told her i have this really weird feeling about it and i'm just like i'm trying to stay really aware about how how i feel and when i got off the phone i went to bed and i couldn't fall asleep and there just was, just to touch upon that story what something really interesting that our guide told us like a day before he was like just be really mindful of your dreams. A lot of people experience really intense messages and dreams when they sleep at the base here. So he just said, just, just be mindful. That's all he said. And, and, and so then I, I go, I crawl into bed and Julian is asleep and, and I lie down in the dark and my heart just starts to like <clears throat> pound. Wow. Like to this degree where it was, I could put my hand on my chest and it was almost like someone knocking from the inside, like knocking to come out, like just knocking. And I was just like, it was just like the most intense like palpitation, but it was more just like, like an energy, like just pounding through my chest. And I lied in bed until we were supposed to get up at five because, or even, was it five four, or 4.30? 30. We were supposed to get up some ungodly hours so that we could start to, because yet like the three day core is not an easy thing to do. And I lied in bed. It was like, and, for on and on and on, finally, and I'm sucking on air canisters because I'm terrified that like I'm dying or something. So I'm just like sucking on air canisters, like trying to get as much oxygen. I'm just convinced it's oxygen, and I'm googling things like why is my heart pounding? And there's all these medical things about altitude sickness, saying that it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And so you're just obviously then you get caught in your own feedback loop because now your heart pounds more because now you're really <laughs> and like it's just like it feeds it's, it's it eats its own tail and, and you go and you go finally. and so finally I, I i don't even recognize that i fall asleep but maybe an hour before we were supposed to get up i fall asleep and i had the most vivid dream it was unbelievable where we were on clash and we were in this mountain pass and i've never told anyone this story really before you guys it's really crazy and we were trudging through snow and I was like, I remember being like, I didn't think there'd be snow up here. This is weird. And so we're trudging through like, like knee deep snow. And I had, I had my hiking poles and I was going and I, I, there was this voice telling me to keep going. And it said, you must keep trying. You must keep trying. And it was starting to feel fatigue and feel exhaustion and feel like I couldn't make it. And I got down on a knee and I was like, started to crawl through the snow and crawl and crawl. And then I remember in this dream, I lied down in the snow and I said to this voice, I said, I'm done. This is it. Like, I can't make it. Like, I don't, I don't know what else. I, I've given everything I can give. Wow. And the voice came and I said, that's okay. You did everything you can do. Sleep now. And the second that he said sleep now, I sat up in my bed. And I was just like, like, just like, it was the most 
I was convinced it was real. So I was shocked that I was alive because I had come to peace. I found like an actual peace with this voice that told me that to, it was okay. And so I believed. I was like, well, we all have to go sometime. And this is a beautiful place as any to go because I'm the most spiritual mountain in the world. And when I woke up and I would just start crying and I turned, woke up Juliana and I turned to her and I said, if I go up that mountain, I will not come down. There's like this, that's it. And so we walked in and we woke up to our other two guys. We sat on the bed, I told them about my dream. And they looked at me with all thought about what our guide had said. And, and we all do. We were just like, we have to leave. And my heart was still pounding. Like it never stopped the whole time. So then I go and knock on the guide's door and I tell him, I'm like, we have to get out of here. Like my body, like I've had a message. And he said, this is exactly what happened to his friend. He'd done the chorus 72 times at that point. And the guide. The guide. Mm -hmm. He's done it over and over and over, but he did it once with a friend and his friend had the same experience as I did. Not the dream, but the heart. The heart. Yeah. And he died on the walk because mm -hmm. lots of people die on the walk. And what happens, I guess, it's because of the altitude and the way your heart is pumping blood and oxygen. You go to sleep and then at a specific altitude, you just don't wake up. Because well, it's like there's not enough like oxygen. Well, the water goes into your, no, oxygen goes into your blood. Like it gets pumped yeah. funny from your lungs into your blood and yeah, then your brain, it has an aneurysm and then you're just. There's some sort of a yeah. reason for it, but there's people that have. Died oh yeah. The and then he told us a story about a woman who had the same dream and they left and he's like, you're doing the right thing. Well, Let's they had like a dream where there was like a deep, deep message. And it was really interesting because the day before that I had a deep dream, but it wasn't really anything like it, but I had a dream where we were on the mountain and I had three giant like Bali looking wooden doors and I had to choose to walk through a door. Mm -hmm. and that was an insignificance because I was like, oh, I don't know what this means, you know, so it was like life or death or the three doors. But Anyways, just can I finish the craziest thing that happened afterwards? Yeah, I guess so. So when we got back, we left to bed. We'll come back to when we left that day. But yeah, you told us. So just because it, it finishes the story. When we were in Nepal, we were paying for another thing and we were in this tour office and we started talking to our tour guide and he was showing us some pictures because he just came back from he the He was Kora. there like a week after we were there. Yeah. He's like, oh, I just got back. From the Kalash Kora. And so he's like, do you want to see some photos? So we were looking through some photos and he came across this one picture and Mark was like, wait, 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 like stop, show me that picture again. And there was this photograph of him in this tour, but it was this valley with snow. Knee deep snow. And at Mark the was pass. like, this was exactly what I saw in my dream. It was exactly, he, was, he passed it quickly and I was like, oh, fuck, stop, go back. And yeah. he went back and I looked at it and I basically almost broke out in tears. Because this like, is what came to my dreams. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is exactly, exactly. It was so. That's the story of Clash. That's the story of Clash. But we left that yeah. morning and we went to Mount, to Lake Menas, I can never say it. Can Lake Manasarvar. Manasarvar. <laughs> which yeah. is the holiest lake. It feeds into the three rivers that feed that whole region of the world. And we had the most incredible day. So we spent the whole time at the lake. And that's, again, just to, to add to it, it's one of the most spiritual lakes. And again, it was that energy that I was saying from before, how you just, it's unexplainable. And there's many people that go there and they, they pray. And, you know, there's a lot of groups of um, Hindus that kind of come together because it's really, really spiritual. And, uh, spiritual like in hinduism and yeah it was um it was, and and i didn't i don't it was sad at first i felt i felt like i missed like some opportunity to walk the quorum but i realized it's just not meant for me at that time, at that time. and then mm -hmm. what we experienced at the lake later that day we wouldn't have had time in our itinerary to experience and that like we got to bathe well we weren't supposed to bathe but we got into the water and we cleansed ourselves and we drank from it which they say um has great significance like, apparently when you drink the water it can purify from your sins from a hundred lifetimes that's what they believe in in hinduism and we shot some the most amazing yoga videos too of like the most special pieces of content and we shot a few meditation like and it was just this i didn't want to leave mm -hmm. it, i was like we can't but eventually we had to because at that point, the guy was like, we have to get you down to proper altitude or you're going to die. 
So we were like, okay, let's go. So we just, he had to make all these crazy calls. He had to change the end of our trip. Mm-hmm. Because to get out of Tibet is just as hard as getting in. So he had to rearrange the whole itinerary and book all new places and get government approvals. And like, because we were leaving early, we left three days early from Tibet because of that. Because mm-hmm. we were just like, we cut the last little piece off. Because um, yeah, mm-hmm. that was that was it. And at that point, wow. I know that we, I know that we, we had taken, not taken, we had been given as everything that we needed from the trip Mm -hmm. and anything more like to push it like it was really funny because it was like an ego thing to walk away from El Kalash because you wanted to say like I did the core I did say that and you hear your Mm -hmm. ego suffering as you're challenging it with very rational but not very rational reasoning I had a dream to most egos don't understand that but to my sense of being I knew that this dream was real I knew that someone that voice I knew that voice that was an angel I get it. Like, there's no doubt in my soul. Your spirit guy. It was my spirit mm-hmm. guy telling me, like, trying to help me through the situation and showing me what was going to happen. And so it was this weird battle with the ego to leave Tibet because you don't want to say, well, we got there and then, but it doesn't matter. Well, because I- Was there a specific spiritual reason for doing the Kora? Oh, yeah. So the pilgrims from different religions will come and travel from Hinduism so and Buddhism, Buddhism and, and Bon religion. religion. Mm-hmm. And they all have different reasons. But for the most part, when you walk the Korah, in the most general sense, you're cleansing yourself mm-hmm. so that when you die, your karma is clean again. Some so, some Hindus will come at, like the, old, at, at older, the oldest yeah. age because they are ready to die on the Korah. They come for the sole purpose yeah, of they come. The there's Korah. a lot of Indian tourists, actually, that yeah. come and... Yeah, you'll see some elderly people and they, to them, they're like, well, if I die on this trek, it could be the biggest gift that I can give to myself because they believe in Hinduism that Shiva lives at the top of Mount Kalash. That is like their, their beliefs. And so when it's they're, their home. yeah, so when they're so close to Shiva, like that is the most pure place that they want to leave their bodies. And so, so to walk it, you yeah, wait your whole life to go because it yeah. will cleanse you of everything in your life that you need cleansing. From. But it's a difficult track. It's oh, really yeah. difficult, not just because of the altitude, but you know, you're going through terrains and it's, it's, it's hard and, and it's dangerous. And it's long and three days and yeah. it, it's everything about it. Well, and, and, oh, I was just going to say, you know what it sounds like just a little bit to me from listening to your previous story about like the kind of macro of the trip being, it doesn't have to be all this doing and it can be just this being that like the position that your heart was in. It's like all you needed to do is just go and soak in this lake and you had your Cora. You just yeah. didn't need to like struggle through all of that. Totally. No, I, exactly. I, and that's exactly how I see it. I think it's very intuitive. Yeah. It's like that's all we were that, looking for is to co- reconnect with that energy, to feel that energy within us. And it came to us from a different place than we expected. And we thought that we would walk the core and then we would feel enlightened and like completely purified. But like you said, yeah, like maybe what was meant for us was just to sit there and to feel the energy in whatever way it presented it to us. And that was in the lake. Yeah. And that was where that reconnection happened for us. And we felt purified. You know, you mm-hmm. felt this purity and lightness and just gratefulness for your life and to be able to be here and to experience these things and, and to see other people praying and being grateful for their life. And you felt this connection of humanity yeah. in that one place where you're like, we're all just these energies in human form all seeking something. And there we are on this beautiful holy lake, reconnecting with that source, that oneness that connects us all in the end. You know, it's very special. It was very mm-hmm. special. And that was Tibet. I have a, my best friend, um, she, she also went to Tibet for four months. And she yeah. said, yeah, she, this was a long time ago and um, maybe 25 years ago or so. And she went with a, um, what they call a tartan, like a treasure finder. Oh. But I just remember her saying, she has fascinating stories. I'll have to send you guys a recording or something, you know, about, well, let's just say, exactly as you guys are saying, she was saying, you know, like you would read in books about like the miracles and the magic and the teachers and what was possible. And, you know, that these treasure finders would like 
find a treasure on the top of a turtle's back walking out of a lake or like pull it out of a tree or a rock and it would be like this message of you know or or like a, a new pecha or like a teaching right for the times and she had thought before she went that it was like you know story fairy tales right like it's just in the storybooks and maybe it's just and she felt so much that when she went, it was like so alive and well, and that miracles were happening every single day, just like in the, in the books. And, and it sounds like they're still happening, yeah. <laughs> despite everything. <laughs> I think so that's, that's a great way to kind of like enclose everything in that way. It's mm -hmm. like no matter all of this political things that are happening in the turmoil and the oppression, Outside of it all, there's still this magic to this beautiful place in the world called Tibet. No matter how much they want to clamp it down yeah. and control it. You can't take away that magic. It. You just can't take away that magic. No one can. And this duality mm -hmm. is so special. And if we could go back, I would one day when we have kids, I would take my, my, my kids there or my child. or I would I pray that we have an opportunity to one day. Mm -hmm. And and that would be my only hope. And if, if that can't happen, that's okay because we were able to do it. But I would recommend it to everyone yeah. as, as hard as it was, because it was very hard, not just physically, because it was not just that one night with Kalash, like the full time is a physical challenge at that altitude and with the type of food that we as vegans were sort of living on, living on, because there's not a lot of vegetation at all there. And so it was, not just with that, but the emotional and the spiritual challenge of what you see and what you experience and that duality and making sure that for all of the darkness that you assess, you have to really find the light and seek it to balance it out. And for that, and to see these things, like if anyone ever said, should I go? I said, if you can, you have to. Because if this is how it is now, and I imagine what it was like 25 years ago, yeah. in another 25 years, it will be much, much less of what it is today. The magic will still exist, but as all of the Tibetans we talked to, they said, we, like, it's dissolving. It's slowly, slowly dissolving. And they're doing their best to hold on. They're doing their best to keep the culture alive and to keep their kindness, which was kind and generous and, and mm -hmm. thoughtful people that, like, that are just, like, bound by happiness, yet being oppressed from all sides. But how long... Can it survive how it has? I don't are, know. are the young people speaking Tibetan or Chinese? In Lhasa, um, I think Chinese and Chinese. Tibetan. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly Chinese. But mostly Chinese. Mm -hmm. So the language and, is dissolved. Oh, yeah. They're doing yeah. what they can in all levels of controlling Buddhism, as in like the, the government of China trying to control it there and pick the leaders and pick the dialogue about it and then also do their best to dissolve that as well as the language and the culture. And so, yeah, I think the language is going, I think the traditions are going, I think everything is, the westernization is coming in, like Lhasa outside of the metal detectors is just like any other Chinese city. Shigatse felt like you're in China, like, because it is part of China. And with all due respect, I can't comment on the fact that it's not that I don't like China. It's not that I have anything against Chinese people. It's nothing like that. But the it's it's been absolving the culture and replacing it with their own. That may be the way of the world and it might be natural, it might not. That's to be debated. But it's also sad no matter how you look at it. Yeah. And so if you can go and you can go sooner than you like anyone that's listening that wants to go, like go before it's gone. Yeah. You know? It'll be a trip of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah. amazing. And if you don't have the physical fortitude, go to Nepal and India and hang out with refugee communities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, actually. That's Dharm, a great way to say it. Dharamshala in India, that's where a lot of the Tibetan refugees are. It's a beautiful place to reconnect because there's so many little restaurants and little like... Well, McLeod Ganj. McLeod Ganj, yeah. It's just a little north of Dharamshala. Just up the mountain from Dharamshala. And you get to see where like the Dalai Lama lives and there's a lot of like monasteries and uh, it's, it's just beautiful. very, very special. And Nepal, I mean, we love Nepal. Nepal is actually one of the places we can't wait to go back when we can. It has a very special place in our hearts. And yeah, it's just a very it's a beautiful place in the world up there. There's so yeah. much, so much richness in it. It's so lovely to speak with you guys. I hope we get a chance to hang out in person at some point. Yeah, that would be Love amazing. To. Love to.
last question is, do you have any words of wisdom, advice, something you commonly find yourself telling others or just anything that springs to your heart in this moment for our listeners? Wow, that's a great question. Never tune out the voice that whispers in your heart. I think all of us have a feeling and intuition and energy that guides us through our path. But in our life these days, especially, there's so much fear that can come in and stop us in its way and make us doubt ourselves and this passion and this guidance that we feel. And I believe that if we can all take more time, reconnect with that voice, nurture. with that energy, yeah, and nurture it, it'll take us to some beautiful places along our own personal paths. It doesn't need, you don't need to go to Tibet to do it. No. You don't no. need to quit your job and change your life. Sometimes it just means that you need a little bit more time doing what you love or mm. focusing on figuring out what it is that feeds you and feeds that, that, that whisper. Yeah, and that reconnection. And like, of course, there are places in the world like Tibet where you feel that energy intensely, but that doesn't mean that you can't go to your backyard or to a, a lake nearby in your hometown and, and still reconnect with the energy because the energy is everywhere. It's, everywhere. it's not just in one place. And I truly believe if we all find a little bit of time in our days to stop the external noise and take that moment to reconnect, it'll, it'll guide us somewhere special because each and every one of us are on our own path and we're going somewhere. And yeah. um, it's important to I always find that. that time to reconnect with it. Mm -hmm. That was a good choice. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. well, this has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Please let us know when your meditation course comes out. We can send it out to everybody. I'd love to see it. Yeah, yeah. no, we can't wait to, yeah, to create it. We actually, we're trying to keep a conversation going with savetibet.org because we're trying to get some of their guidance to help us have the money go to the right place. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that kind of administrative work we're trying to figure out right now but so we just we've known that wait. we've been really busy since coming back from tibet yeah and really like engrossed in boho beautiful and its demands that we've known that we need when we do this we kind of like we have it and ready and when we are going to do put it together that we need the space like this has rewarded us mm -hmm. to to go back and to reconnect to where we were at the time it's not just something that gets, and it's so it's special and we're being very pragmatic i think about when the time is and it's funny with, with covid and with the, the era we've now entered we feel that, that time is coming very soon so we're thinking about starting in july mm -hmm. we wanted to really get our live streaming class game going to help everyone who can't go to their yoga studio now so now that that's up and running we had to put an app on sort of the sidelines to do that. So we're going to finish that. And then we know that's that's Then next. we have a little bit of time to put our energy into it. And to really focus on it. Yeah, and create yeah. it and like put it all together and, and mold it into it's something good. special. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be one of the things we're most proud of that Bo mm -hmm. has allowed us the opportunity to. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And what are the ways that people can get more of you or what are the projects that you're working on? How can people find you or these live streams? Yeah, um, well... YouTube, <laughs> for sure, YouTube page. We're posting quite often these more days, than more than ever before. It's slower so, than we were a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so go, youtube.com slash beautiful. That's, you know, you just Google that. Instagram, we tend to post a lot more of like our personal thoughts and feelings. That is Boho Beautiful Life. That's the handle of our Instagram. And the live streaming right now, we're doing it through our Patreon community which we kind of created to give people more of exclusive content. We're keeping it as a pay what you can model because of COVID right now. So it's like a dollar a month, really. You can get in and, and get like hour long classes. And that's where we started doing our live streams right now. And we're going to keep doing that. So we just did two this week. We're going to do another one on Saturday. But then eventually those live streams will also go into YouTube, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. kind of like those three platforms right now are really our, our main platforms that we're focusing on. And um, yeah, finding a lot of value, just connecting with people through it and being able to, to share what we can and to serve in any way we can. Mm. I love it. You two are the sweetest ever. Oh my God. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was so great to meet you. And yeah. thank you for, for your energy. And yeah, just, this has been really special. 
Mark and I were saying we're like since we've been back we haven't really talked about it with anyone you know just life kept moving forward and we did a video and that was really special to relive it and to connect with people through it but then ever since that happened things just move so fast you know so to take a moment today and just relive all the experiences has been very special so thank you for for giving us the opportunity to do that today it's Mm -hmm. really amazing thank you for doing that with us really appreciate you guys being here thank you so much thank you so much for listening to the flower lounge i'm katie hess and we'll be releasing a new podcast every wednesday if you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation share it with them and don't forget to subscribe To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.